Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Please uh, note that the workshop is being recorded, and we appreciate if you would remain on mute with your video off throughout the presentation. We'd like to welcome you to day two of the second annual New Jersey Youth Transition Conference. My name is Janine Brinkley, and I represent SPAN Parent Advocacy Network on behalf of the Youth Transition Conference Planning Committee. Um, periodically, we will place a registration form in the chat box for you to share your contact information so that we can share recordings and resources from the workshop with you. Please note, if you're seeking continuing education credit, you're required to complete the form as this is the contact method by which we will send you proof of attendance. Today's workshops, uh, the remainder of the workshops today will be hosted via the same link you've joined with now. You can see the full schedule on our website and we will share the agenda on this screen after the conclusion of this workshop. I'm pleased to let you know that today our presenter is Sean Benoit from the Community Health Law Project. Sean will be presenting on the topic of special education transition services and supported decision-making. Take it away, Sean. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Janine. All right, bear with me, folks. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Okay. All right. So uh, well, let me just get the slideshow started. Sorry. Here we go. There we are. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, and uh, just a quick thank you uh, to the uh, to all the folks at the uh, Youth Transition Conference for uh, inviting me uh, to speak. And thank you for, for participating in this workshop and being here this morning. Um, so just to let folks know, uh, this is the Special Education Transition Services and Supported uh, Decision-Making uh, Workshop. My name is Sean Benoit. I am the Managing Attorney for the Community Health Law Projects uh, Union Hudson Regional Office. Um, oops, there we go. Okay, just, just a, so uh, basically what I would like to do in this workshop, I'm just gonna give a quick background on my agency just so everybody knows uh, what we do. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm, I'm gonna give a brief overview of special education because it's, it's hard to talk about transitional services without talking about special education uh, in general, what the standards are uh, and how special education works. Then we'll talk about uh, transitional services, what the transition planning should, uh, I say what it should look like. Obviously, every every child or young adult, um, their their needs are are unique, and uh, the planning should be individualized. So, um, you know, but I'll talk a little bit about what you generally want to kind of look for in transition planning. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, you know the types of evaluations you want to see to help with transition planning, and you know how the IEP process works. Although I imagine for a lot of folks, um, especially whether you have a child that's now a, a teenager, young adult, or you're working with uh, clients uh, that are that are in that age range. Um, a lot of folks are familiar with the evaluations, the IEP process, but I'm going to talk a little bit about it, as well as ways to possibly kind of um, resolve issues, uh, you know, through uh, administrative means um, that folks might not necessarily be familiar with. Uh, then we'll talk about some more kind of uh, uh, the transitional services that you might see for somebody as they come into adulthood depending on their disability, the different types of supportive decision-making that could be out there, whether it's uh, power of attorneys, healthcare proxies, supported decision-making, uh, and then all the way to, I, I kind of cap it off by talking a little bit, uh, you know, about guardianship, um, which generally is kind of like a, kind of the, I don't want to say last resort, that sounds terrible. Um, it, once you get through supported decision-making, if it's, if, if a person needs more help than that, uh, then we kind of look at guardianship as a possible uh, alternative. And we'll talk a little bit about that. So that's kind of uh, where I'm going to go with the presentation. So again, I am with the Community Health Law Project. We are a nonprofit uh, organization that provides legal and advocacy services to folks with disabilities uh, here in uh, New Jersey. We are statewide. We have uh, five regional offices to make sure that we can cover all of the counties throughout New Jersey. We have an administrative office. Uh, and then we have a couple of uh, satellite offices, but we try to make sure that we have the ability to service folks uh, in, in every county uh, in New Jersey. Um, we serve customers who have a lot of our a lot of our clientele do have mental health um, services in place. Uh, we also service clientele that have physical disabilities, developmental uh, developmental disabilities, uh, and visual and hearing impairments, and, and we cover a wide variety of areas. 
Social Security benefits, you know, if somebody uh, was denied SSI or SSD, we'll, we'll represent an eligibility. We'll also represent on overpayment cases. Um, we do public entitlements, welfare, food stamps. Uh, we do, uh, unfortunately, because of the pandemic and coming out of the pandemic, we are dealing with a lot of landlord tenant more so than I think we wouldn't, you know, uh, earlier years. Uh, so we do a ton of, uh, we have been doing a ton of landlord uh, tenant uh, issues. We represent uh, tenants, uh, low income tenants with disabilities. Uh, we do, uh, we do limited guardianships. Uh, we do sp have some special education work, consumer protection, debt collection, Medicaid, Medicare. Um, we try to handle uh, a, a lot of as many issues as our clients have. We have what we call a holistic needs approach. We look to what issues the client may have outside of what they originally came in for, and we try to assist them. Uh, a good example, and I, you know, I put it here. Um, you know, you might have a client that a tenant coming in, they have a, you know, an eviction matter going on, but uh, you know, maybe their 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 Medicaid's been sanctioned, their their health needs aren't being addressed, or a bigger one that we see. Um, sometimes their income, something's happened to their income. Their SSI has been uh, sanctioned or turned off or their SSD, and that's led to the landlord-tenant matter. And we try to resolve all the issues uh, for the clients. Uh, as I mentioned, we service uh, the entire state. Uh, these are our, the um, addresses and uh, contact numbers for our offices. Uh, for those of you, you don't have to uh, scramble to write down the information. Um, I'll put my uh, email uh, in the chat box. And also, if you uh, you can get a copy of the slide presentation if you reach out to the host uh, of the uh, Youth Transition Conference. They do have my uh, PowerPoint presentation, and it can be uh, sent to you. All right, so I'm going to delve into uh, special education at this uh, at this point in time. Like I said, I, I do want to, this, the purpose of this workshop is to talk about uh, the transitional services and the types of services that people can receive. Um, Oopsie. Uh, but it, it, it definitely is a good idea to kind of just start with the basics of special education law. This way, uh, everyone's kind of on the same page about how, how the IDEA and special education works. So when we talk about special education law, we're talking about the IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Now, uh, this is a federal law, and it's been on the books uh I believe it originated back in 1974, but it went under a different, uh, it went under a different name then. And then uh, I believe in the late 70s, early 80s, it was changed to the IDEA, but the framework of it traces all the way back to 1974. So we've had uh, nigh on uh, 50 years of special education being uh, something that, uh, that students with disabilities are uh, entitled to and, and can benefit from. Um, if for any uh, for any attorneys uh, or paralegals in the audience, I do have citations here to the law, the IDA and federal law. You'll you'll find it in 20 USC 1400, as well as the uh, the federal regulations that uh, that expand upon it. And uh, so each state enacts the IDEA here in New Jersey. Um, and again, this is more so for attorneys and paralegals. Um, NJAC 6A colon 14. Well, even for parents, if we have parents, consumers, um, in, you know, in, in the audience. If you Google NJAC 6A colon 14, you will you can get it in PDF form. There's so many websites that'll pop up. You can get the entire uh, New Jersey regulations for special education. And um, I know it might be easy for me to say that it's a fairly easy read. I mean, I you know I, I do think a lot of the stuff in the regulations that we have here in New Jersey in the code, I do think that it is fairly easy to read um and, and it is something that that parents can follow along in and it does outline what uh what a student's rights are it's not a bad idea to you know to print it out and kind of have it on hand before you go into you know your first iep meeting there's different things you can read up on um so that's just kind of how uh, special education law and you know how it kind of comes into existence so when we talk about special education we're talking about specially designed instruction at no cost to the parents and it has to meet the, the needs of a child with a disability. And that instruction could be in the classroom. It can be at home, in hospitals, institutions. Uh, you know, we say detention. I, I don't like to use the word uh, jail, but I mean, if there's like a, you know, if, if you have a youth that is in, um, that, that is in, in, in a detention type setting, even if you have, uh, I say a youth, a young, a young person ages 18 to 21, even if they're not in a youth facility, but they're in an adult facility, or if they're under the age of 18 and they've been waived up and they're placed in an adult facility, they're still entitled to special education services, e even the transitional services. And that stuff, uh, I haven't done any of those cases in a while, but years ago, I used to have to uh, bring some cases, whether, whether a client was with um, 
you know, the JJC or they were in the Department of Corrections. I actually did have one uh, that was in the Department of Corrections. Um, basically, if they had stopped providing services, there was no graduation, no IEP, nothing. And uh, the, the person was 18, he needed services. So you can get services in, in pretty much any, any situation. Um, and that's something that it's important to note, you know, if the, if the child uh, is suffering from some type of illness or something, they are at home, they cannot leave the house, you do, you are entitled to special education as home instruction. Uh, you know, if somebody has to go residential and patient somewhere, again, uh, those special education services still have to be uh, provided. Um, and special education, a lot of time we, a lot of times we think about, you know, the academics when we think about education and special education instruction is not limited to academics. And that's important because we talk about transitional services and, and that's not always going to come in the form of uh, academics, you know, it could be life skills, it could be job coaching, job training. Um, you can get it in all different uh, areas, as you can, as you can see, social skills, uh, behavioral modification. It, it really has to be, you know, the instruction has to be designed to what uh, to what the child's um, to what the child's needs are. Um, all righty. Oops. Bear with me. Sorry. Oh, there we go. Um, so who qualifies uh, for special education services? Well, in order to be eligible for special education, you have to be a child with a disability, and that is a child that has a physical, emotional, learning, and or cognitive uh, disability, who because of their condition needs special education and, and related services. Um, you know, they need it in order to be, they need it in order to benefit, to, to, to benefit from the educational program. And, you know, when we say disability, again, it is important, it could be one or the other. One of the reasons I mentioned it is, is sometimes, you know, it, it isn't going to be a learning disability. Sometimes it could be, you know, th there is something going on uh, emotionally. And, you know, if you have a child with, say, like ADHD and they're, they're not able to kind of stay on task and they need, you know, you could be a 504 plan, could be an IEP, but, uh, but all kinds of disabilities you can qualify for. There's, um, Oh uh, God, I think there's like 14, um, there's four, in the New Jersey code, there are 14 classifications, but it, the classifications, it's kind of like you have to find a way to fit into one of those categories, but, um, but there are so many uh, diagnoses that you could have that will qualify for special education that might not neatly line up with a classification. So if you're never sure, always ask for the, uh, for the initial eligibility evaluations and meet with the child study team. In terms of uh, services, uh, it's ages three uh, through 21. Um, so basically, you know, if you have a child with a disability, it's called pre-K uh, 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 pre with a disability. So prior to kindergarten, if the child does have a disability, they could be entitled to a special education uh, pre-K uh, program. Uh, prior to age three, it's, uh, you know, you, you'd want to turn to early intervention services to get assistance. Uh, and it's, uh, and you, you have between 18 to 21, you have the eligibility to continue in special education services uh, through June of your 21st birthday. So for example, if, uh, if you turn 21 on November 1st, you continue through the school year and you'd be done at the end of uh, June the following you know, year, obviously. Um, one thing to note there, the pandemic, um, because schools were shut down, because there were partial programs during part of the pandemic years, uh, there is a new law in effect that does extend the eligibility past age 21. And I have, uh, I think like four or five slides devoted to that, uh, that should be coming up in just a little bit, because that is something, for, especially with the transitional services and for the kids that are aging out, that is huge to know about. Also between 18 to 21, it's not a get, you're not automatically going to get an IEP and be able to continue in school. It, you do have to show that there is still a need between 18 to 21. Uh, 18 to 21. And, uh, you know, sometimes the school district may not agree, you know, you might be turned, the student might be turning 19 and the school district says, we believe the child is ready for whatever the next step is, whether that's higher education, going out and working or whatever it may be. And they may move to, uh, to graduate the child. Graduation is a change in placement. Uh, as a parent and a student, you do have to receive notice. If you do receive notice uh, of, of graduation, file for due process to reject that and get stay put so you'll continue to receive services while you go through the administrative uh, hearing process. Um, so just kind of, the, there are two, what I call two cornerstones to special education, FAPE and LRE. FAPE is a free appropriate public education. And, and that's the first kind of cornerstone of special education. 
The IDEA requires that all children uh, with a disability between the ages of three and 21 have available a free and appropriate public education. Uh, free means at no greater cost uh, to the child and family than uh, than a not you know than a peer with uh, without a disability. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and, and when we talk about you know what is appropriate, uh, appropriate it's you know it's a legal term. It's a term of art. Uh, you know there's there's a, a case in New Jersey that basically says appropriate mean it's determined to mean meaningful significant progress. Uh, about uh, four or five years ago, uh, the United States Supreme Court took up the issue of FAPE and what constitutes appropriateness in uh, the Andrew case, and they, you know, they made the determination that uh, appropriate means reasonably calculated in light of the child's circumstances. So it's reasonably calculated to deliver, you know, meaningful education. Um, so, so that's the first cornerstone of the uh, of. Uh, ID, of the excuse me of the IDEA, the other cornerstone is what we call LRE. So you have FAPE and LRE. LRE is least restrictive environment. Under the IDEA, a district must try to educate the student in the least restrictive environment. So, so generally, you want to kind of give a, a preference to educating a child with a disability in in the general education classroom with appropriate aids and services. If that is not possible. Uh, basically, what's been developed over the years is, is there's, um, I hate to use the term level of classrooms. I, I, I guess the best way to kind of frame it is, is as in restrictiveness. You know, you, you kind of look at a general education classroom as the most, as the least restrictive uh, environment. And then uh, as you go into the other forms of the classrooms, they tend to be a little bit more restrictive. So if, gen if general education classroom is not the appropriate setting, you look to whether or not uh, the student needs a pull out resource class. So if the student has uh, a learning disability and reading is an issue, then maybe for uh, you know, language arts or you know, reading language arts, the, the student is being pulled out for a special education class solely for that. And then you're in the general education classes for all the other classes. Um, if that's not possible, you know, there, then, then, you know, there's uh, uh, self, there's self-contained classrooms, and that's generally where the student is kind of uh, being, being pulled out, and they're, they're in, uh, they're in a smaller classroom setting for all of the major academics throughout the day, and then they leave for the specials, whether it's you know gym, art, lunch, recess, and things like that, and, and that's kind of where you know that's kind of the most. In an in-district program, that's going to generally kind of be your more restrictive setting. Would be a um, uh, would be that type of a uh, would be that type of a classroom. Um, and then, obviously, if if a student cannot be educated in district, there are out of district placements. Uh, but you know, you do have to show that the the student cannot be educated in in district that their needs cannot be met. And then then it is possible to look at out of district uh, placements. But under the um, under the IDEA, like I said, FAPE and LRE are, are, are the cornerstones of it. Um, so yeah, so LRE, and, and again, for anybody that does want citations, Oberti is one of the, the big cases that really kind of talks about, you know, being in that least restrictive environment for the maximum extent possible. So now we're going to talk about transition services. So I had said special education services constitute a variety of, there's all different kinds of uh, services that special education can provide in addition to just regular kind of academics. And, and so with transition services, starting at age 14, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about IEPs in, in a little bit, but generally what winds up happening is, is, and I'm sure a lot of folks are familiar with the process, but uh, generally if you suspect that, you, uh, that either uh, your child is a student with a disability or you're working with a student that has a disability that may have, you know, be eligible for services, you make a request to the school's child study team and you request initial evaluations to determine eligibility. School district has, uh, I believe it's 90 days to conduct initial evaluations in all suspected areas of the disability. So they call the parent in, they have the initial eligibility meeting, they go over the evals. And if the student is eligible for special education services, they'll develop an initial IEP. Once the initial IEP goes into effect, the school district has to have a, a, an IEP uh, every year. You, you know, sometimes sometimes the annual IEP meeting might fall in the middle of the year, but then it'll cover for the next year. You, 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 you can't have an IEP that covers multiple years. You do need a new IEP every year. You have to have an annual review to review the IEP and update it. Now, that said, a parent can ask for an IEP meeting uh, at, at any point during the school year. They don't have to wait for the annual review meeting. If as a parent or a social worker, case manager, if you feel that the program is not working, 
you can, re well, the parent has to request it, but you, you can request a new IEP meeting to go over the IEP and, and make changes and, and, and talk about what is and what is not working. But once you have the IEP in place, by age 14, you have to, the child study team, they have to start talking about transition services. They have to identify the post-secondary goals. What is that, what is that going to look like when this child is done with high school? What is the child going to go on to? Are you looking to higher education? Are you looking to vocational services? Uh, you know, is this a student that maybe is DDD eligible and they're going to transition into a day program, in which case, you know, you're looking at, at, at life skills programming and things like that. So, so you want to start identifying all that at, 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 at age 14. Um, and, and one of the things to keep in mind, too, is, is and, and again, when I was talking about that age range from 18 to 21, academic requirements may have all been met but the student is not ready to transition to that next stage of life and they can still receive services you know whether again job skills training coaching vocational um it, 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 there's a wide variety of what those transitional services uh can look like <clears throat> so transition uh services it's a coordinated set of activities it's designed to be results oriented. You want to focus on improving academic and functional achievement, and you do want to base it on the individual child's uh, needs. You want to take into account their strengths, their in, their interests, and, and and it should include instruction related services and and, and community experiences. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of school districts. I, you know, I've seen a lot of school districts that'll do, you know if they've developed a good program, they've they've gone out to the community and they've identified work sites. They they, they work with partners out in the community. It could be a you know a, a supermarket like a large chain supermarket. It, it could be an independently owned a small business like a bakery. Um, and and you know some some districts are good. Some some just don't have the resources to do it. And it also sometimes also depends on the geographic area. Um, but, uh, but like I said, you want to schools really kind of, if, if you want to keep the student in district, you want to see that there is that kind of good transitional program where they've developed these, these kind of services and programs. Um, and, and again, it does have to be designed to the students, uh, needs and, and, you know, and, and interests as well, because you, you want to make sure, I mean, it's like kind of what, what I, what I sometimes would tell families, depending on what programs they wanted, you could have. Uh, the best educational program, uh, you know, available for the child. But if the child, like, so a lot of times families will ask about out of district placements and whatnot, especially when the student's older, if they don't want to go, it could be the best program in the world. But if they don't, if the student doesn't buy into it and they don't want to go and they're not participating, um, you know, it, it's not going to give them as much of a benefit. So especially with transition services, that's why it is important to look at the interests that the, that the student has uh, so that it is something where it's something for them to work towards. The transition planning has to be written into the IEP. Um, towards the usually it's towards the back of the IEP, there'll be a page titled "Statement of Transition Planning," and that's that's the page where um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the page where everything is going to be uh, written out in terms of of what services uh, the student is going to get. And you always want to make sure that it's a, a, in writing. Uh, you know, a lot of school districts are good about this, and they, they'll they'll have a comprehensive things will be written. Um, but, you know, but there are times where it isn't. And that's where, you know, that's where I've gotten involved when it's not clear, you know, a family has been told, well, we're going to do A, B, and C. If it's not in the IEP, it can't be enforced. The best way to think of an IEP is to think of it as like a, a contract, because it is, it's binding. Once it's proposed and it goes into effect, um, it, it's going to be binding on, on, on the school district, and it's also going to be binding on the parent uh, and, and the student. And so if something is not being met, you have options available to you. You could, uh, you could file, um, you know, you could file a complaint investigation with the New Jersey uh, Department of Ed's Office of Special Education, uh, OSE. If you file a complaint investigation, if, if there's a service that's clearly laid out in the IEP. So for example, um, uh, trying to give an example. Uh, let's, say, let's, say, let's say the transition planning calls for uh, placement in an automotive uh, uh, program and uh, a specific automotive program at you know high school a 
And if, if the student, if for some odd reason the district is not providing it, they say, well, we changed our mind or you know, something along those lines, that's something easy. You, you can file a complaint investigation with the Office of Special Ed saying that the IEP is not being followed and you can seek enforcement of it. Um, you can file for due process to get in front of a judge to enforce it. That can take a lot longer. But if the IEP clearly lays out the service and it is clearly not being provided, uh, I always say complaint investigation with OSC is the quickest and easiest way because there's a uh, to remember off the top of my head, I think it's a 60 day timeline to resolve a complaint investigation. Sometimes they'll call they'll call you for mediation and you can get a mediation set up within like a week or two uh, if they're not, you know, if OSC isn't too backlogged. So I think um, so, again, you want to make sure it's in writing, because if it's in writing, it's it, it's clear to all parties what the expectations is, what are what the program is. And it can be enforced. Um, so uh, just to kind of continue on, so if, if the so when we talk about transition planning, if the plan is just to enter the workforce, if that's the ultimate post you know uh, post high school goal is to uh, uh, to go into the workforce, how is that going to be achieved? The transition plan should have a summary of the programs and related services that's going to help the child uh, or student. I keep saying child help the student get there. You know, uh, is it going to be a vocational school or, or program? Is it going to be specific classes? Um, you know, is it something where there's going to be, again, I, I, I harp on the job sampling and job coaching. That's, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of districts that have really great, uh, those great programs set up out in the community like that. Um, and, and it's, you know, it's been, it's been great for a lot of my clients. So you want to see is that, you know, if that's where entering the workforce is, is the goal. Well, you know, what are we talking about in terms of job sampling and job coaching? If, if your district doesn't offer that, or, you know, then do you look to an out of district placement? Do you look to something private that has that? Um, one thing to bring up, and it's not so much an issue now. Well, it's still a little bit of an issue. The, the last two years, it was a huge issue. Um, COVID-19, I, I did have a lot of, and, and again, we're going to get to the whole extension of the graduation time uh, for students aging out in, in just a few minutes. Um, but there, there, there were a lot of COVID-19 related issues in regards to job sampling and job coaching. A lot of job sites did shut down during and throughout the pandemic, and they, they were very slow to open up. Um, you know, I'd heard from some districts, not every, not all the programs that they had developed with the, you know, with the businesses, not all of them reopened because some businesses didn't want more, didn't want students coming in because, you know, their staff are wearing masks. They want to try and kind of uh, keep contact limited. So, so that has been a little bit of an ongoing issue. It's just something to worth kind of noting. Um, one thing I did want to say, when you look at the transition planning, if, 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 if the IEP, if the transition plan in the IEP just says referral to DVRS and there's really nothing else in there, that, that to me, that's not sufficient. And there is case law out there to kind of say that's not sufficient. You know, obviously DVRS, CBVI, and I'll talk about those different programs. DVRS is Division of Vocational Rehabilitation Services. Uh, you know, it's a great agency, uh, great services, um, and, and it can provide a lot of help to the student as they transition. Um, but for, for, for an IEP transition plan to merely do referrals in it and nothing else, that, that's not sufficient. And it could be a denial of faith. It, it, Again, it's kind of, it's individualized. It depends on the student. I'm not saying if that's all it says, it's automatically a denial of faith. You do have to look to the specific circumstances, but there is case law out there that does say, if a transition plan just has the boxes checked off to make referrals for the student, there's a good chance it could be a denial of faith. Um, and in other words, it's not appropriate for the student. But again, you can certainly, and you should have other agencies involved. Uh, DDD, DVRS, CBVI, DMOS, these are just some of the agencies that are out there to help students uh, and young adults as they transition, uh, you know, into adulthood. Uh, DDD, the Division of Developmental Disabilities, um, you know, they provide services uh, to individuals with developmental disabilities. They'll have day services and day programs. Uh, they'll also have residential services. Um, and, and a lot of times if the student has a developmental disability, usually what you're looking at is, is after you're done with school. So after June of your 21st birthday, you're going to kind of transition into DDD. And that's something that gets set up far in advance so that once the school program ends, the DDD day program will kind of start and pick up so that there's really no loss in services. But again, you want to you want to make sure that's coordinated and, and that can certainly be done through the IEP team as the student starts to age out. Uh, CBVI, the Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired, uh, they have a lot of programs, and again, it's a, a good referral to see what assistance CBVI uh, can provide to the student as they age out. And as I mentioned, DVRS, 
the Division of Vocational Rehabilitation Services. A lot of, lot of great programs, vocational guidance, counseling, job placement, uh, post-secondary education uh, opportunities, vocational skills training, a lot of, lot of great services. And, um, you know, definitely, you know, as students age out, it's definitely a good referral to make, but you don't want to rely solely on that. You do want to make sure the student is getting services through, through the district. Um, another one, if the plan is independent living, you know, what program is being offered, you want to be looking at like life skills, functional academics, you know, uh, functional academics, you know, you want to make sure the student is able to, um, I always say balance a checkbook, but I, you know, uh, I, I don't think anybody truly uses a checkbook anymore, but, um, you know, just making sure that they're going to be able to pay bills and monitor, you know, like their account and things like that. Um, that's what you would generally kind of be, uh, kind of be looking towards. What I want to talk about right now is evaluations. And the reason I want to talk about evaluations is just when we talk about transitional planning, there is a great, great evaluation that can really help with transitional planning called a functional vocational assessment. But before I talk about the FVA, let me let me back up a second. Under special education law, students are entitled to uh, to evaluations. Right at the get-go, you do the, the school districts, the child study team will do the initial evaluations to determine eligibility. At a bare minimum, once every three years, throughout throughout the student's special education career, uh, school career, uh, at a bare minimum, once every three years, the student should be uh, should be uh, receiving new um, <clears throat> new uh, evaluations. Uh, you'll hear the term triennials. I, I've never liked that term because it implies that the student and the family can only get these evaluations once every three years, and that's not actually. Like I was saying before, NJAC 6A colon 14. It, it's worth printing out, you know, or, or you know, downloading onto your, you know, uh, laptop devices, whatever, and, and just reading through it because what the language uh, says in regards to evaluations um, is, uh, and I think it, it's a 2.3 6A colon 14 just with the well, anyway, What the language says about evaluations is, is it says that. It says that you can have an evaluation as long at a bare minimum once every three years, but new evaluations can be requested as long as it has been greater than one year since the last evaluation. So if you suspect something has changed, you can request a new evaluation. Um, you know, if, if if you did a learning evaluation a year and a half ago and, you know, your child, you know, you have a child in the sixth grade, but they're reading at a first grade level. And that was a year and a half ago. And now, you know, whatever program they're with, you see, well, they're still at a first grade level. Request a new learning evaluation. See what's going on, because maybe changes need to be made to the program. Um, and and, and it's, it is somewhere, again, as long as, it's, as long as it has been greater than one year, you can get new evaluations done. Um, families are, and students are also entitled to independent uh, evaluations. Um, and, and basically, with with an independent evaluation, that's an evaluation where um, where where the parent can choose the evaluator and the school district pays for it. Um, it's a, it's a it can be a tad bit more complex than that. Um, while the parent can choose, uh, you know, a qualified uh, 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 evaluator uh, that's local in the community and charges a reasonable rate, the reality is is that it's got to go through the board of ed for board uh, approval for payment and things like that. What I always tell parents are, is when you request the independent evaluation, one, request it in writing, always request it in writing. And I always say, end it by saying, please send me, and, and be specific, say all the evaluation you, you want, not just one, because you may want multiple ones and you don't want to have to keep going back and forth. Just ask for all the ones you want. If you want an independent learning, independent psychiatric, independent psycho, ask for them all, all, you know, all in one shot. And then, and then I always say end it, and, and you can do it via email, however you want to do it, but always make sure it's in writing. I always say end it by saying, um, please send me a list of, uh, uh, of the district's pre-approved evaluators, but please be advised I am not limited solely to choosing off that list. Um, and I, I'd say like 90% of the time, uh, I'm usually, when I'm working with a family, we're usually able to find an evaluator that's on the pre-approved list. Uh, that that we feel is independent and fair and will do a good job. Um, and if you can't find somebody, then what I always tell folks are, um, you know, call up those evaluators, find out what they charge. So let's say let's say you request an independent learning, they give you these three places, and they all charge you know a thousand bucks for the evaluation. So then when you go out and you say, okay, well I've decided I'm going to go with you know uh, learning consultant A, you know LLC, 
And you say, Learning Consultant A LLC charges $1,000. The three people you sent me charge $1,000. Please submit it to the Board of Ed for, for approval. So that's that's what I've done. And it, it does get a little bit complicated. But um, but like I said, 90% of the time, I think we, you know, I've always been able to, to work with a list of pre-approved uh, evaluators. But you always want to have that language saying, send me the list, but be advised I'm not limited to choosing solely off that list. So that's how evaluations work. I just wanted to give the background because, again, to focus on transitional services, one of the best evaluations that you're going to see with transitional services is a functional vocational assessment. If you get a good functional vocational assessment, it's going to identify what the student's interests are you know, versus the skills and their abilities. Because like I was saying earlier on, you, you do want to take the student's interest into account when you're developing a transition plan. Um, because if the student isn't interested in it, they're not going to be engaged and, and they might not get the benefit out of it. And, and a good FVA is going to take into account the student's uh, interests. Um, there we go. Uh, so it's going to, I mean, an FVA, an FVA, uh, it, you know, they're going to look at the cognitive skills, motor skills, perceptual skills, learning preferences. It, it's really, it's going to be very comprehensive if it's done the right way. Um, just be, be, be aware. Uh, I remember one time uh, sitting in a meeting and we had to ask for an FBA and they said, oh, we already did one. And I said, you did? I said, yeah, it's a skills, uh, it's a skills assessment that we did. It's attached to the psychological evaluation. And, and, and I said, that's, uh, well, thank you for doing that. We appreciate that. But that's not what we're looking for. Um, you know, it, it, functional vocational assessment, you do want to make sure that it is its own evaluation. And, um, you know, and again, if the, if the district says, well, we don't feel it's necessary or we don't have staff to do that, then request it as an independent. Um, the other thing, too, is, is a good FBA. It's it's done like in a work setting environment. Um, there was a place down in South Jersey, and I, I forget the name of the I forget the name of the company that would do them, but they had like they had this huge building. Uh, it was almost like a warehouse and they they had all these different like work set it, like work sites set up in there so that the person could be exposed to different work settings to see like what their interest was, what their skills were. Um, so yeah, so, you know, a good FBA is really going to help you develop, uh, develop the transition plan. So I do, I do recommend, especially kind of when you're hitting 16, 17 years old, um, I do recommend uh, requesting it because it's not something, you know, I, Sometimes I, I want to be very careful too, especially if we have um, folks that work for school districts in the audience. I, I, I've been told sometimes I do speak um, negatively towards school districts, and I never, ever, ever mean to do that. There are some really, really good school districts out there. I think the majority of folks that work at school districts, they, they like their jobs. They're dedicated to the kids. They want to help uh, uh, the students, um, you know, but there are sometimes, uh, you know, I don't like to say there's good and bad districts. But sometimes, uh, sometimes you do get districts where they're not doing the right things for the student. They don't have the right program. The IEP wasn't done right. It does happen. And that's, those were the cases that I would see. So more often than not, I saw where something wasn't working. So I certainly never mean to sound negative towards school districts. And I hope, uh, I, hope I don't offend anybody or come off that way because there are some really good districts and there are really great uh, you know, uh, you know, case managers, ca uh, case workers, teachers, uh, educators out there. Um, the reason I say it that way is, is not, school districts aren't always going to suggest an FBA. Um, and not every student always necessarily needs it. Again, if higher education, if, if, if you know, community college or four-year school, if higher education is, is the post-secondary goal, then an FBA probably is not going to be something that the student needs. But if entering the workforce is, is kind of what the goal is for the student, then yeah, an FBA is an evaluation you definitely want to see uh, being done. Um, so I've talked a little bit about the IEP. Uh, again, I think for a lot of the folks that are probably here, you, uh, you're either working with or you have, uh, you, know, you have kids that have been through the IEP process, you are familiar with the IEP. But again, just to kind of, um, you know, an IEP is an individualized education plan. Best to think of it as a contract. It's a written plan that sets forth the special education programs, related services, and supplementary aids and services that the student is going to receive. It's developed by the IEP team. And this is important to know when we say the IEP team. The IEP team is the school's child study team and the parents. And the students, the students should definitely be participating, you know, at a bare minimum by age 14, especially when we talk transition, the students should be coming in. One of the, this is kind of like a practice tip. 
I, I, you know, I, I remember the first IEP meeting I went to, I was so inexperienced. I remember sitting there and I just, I, I remember the staff going around just talking about the student. The student was there. It was an eighth grader at the time. And, and there was just so many negative things being said about the student, but I wasn't confident enough to be able to shut that down and say, we need to put a stop to this. And it was a learning lesson for me. And I never, after that, I never let a client of mine uh, be in a position like that. Um, what I would recommend doing if you're going to bring the child in, because sometimes even if nobody, and again, I don't mean the best in child study teams or anything like that. That was a very unique situation. But a lot of times, if you're having a good conversation with the child study team, you are talking about the student's weaknesses. You are talking about deficiencies and what needs to be improved. And I think sometimes it can be tough. You know, I, it can sound negative and I don't know. And it's up to a parent to decide, obviously. But I don't know if it's always such a great idea for a student to hear everything in those regards. What I've always suggested doing is, is bringing the student in for a portion of the IEP meeting so that the student can talk about the programs and services that they're receiving, how they're doing, what they want to see in their education, as well as their transitional services, and, and, and have them talk and have it be a conversation. And then once that conversation is over, then maybe send the student back to... Um, you know, back to the classroom, because again, once you kind of get into the nitty gritty of it, you certainly don't want it to have any kind of a, you know, an impact on the student in any detrimental uh, way. But but the students should have input, especially by age uh, uh, 14. But again, the IEP team, it's the child study team, and it's the parent. And, and in a perfect world, you come to a consensus and you develop the IEP. Uh, obviously, it's not a perfect world. So the way the kind of balancing act works is, is at the end of the day, the child study team is going to propose the IEP. And if they overrule the parent's wishes or wants, uh, I say wants, it, 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 I always have to be up, it's not that a parent wants something, it's about what their student, what their child needs. But if they, you know, if there's a disagreement, um, you know, the, the IEP team, they, the child study team, they have the ability to propose the IEP as they want to, but the parent has the ability to file for due process, which I'm gonna talk about in just one uh, second. Um, uh, before I talk about uh, ways to resolve issues, um, like I had said earlier, the IEP has to be done at least once a year, but you can request meetings at any point during the year. One thing I want to make, uh, I wanted to make a quick point out of uh, summertime. You can request an IEP meeting in the summertime. Child study teams are required under the code to work year round. The reason that a lot of times you won't get an IEP meeting in the summertime is more so because to, to have part of the IEP, part of the child study team and the IEP team, you do need a, a general education teacher at the meeting and a special education teacher at the meeting, um, you know, contractually or, uh, you know, I guess through union negotiations, um, obviously they, they're not going to be on staff in the summertime. Uh, from my experience though, and, and again, because there are so many good educators out there, uh, from my experience, when I've requested IEP meetings in the summertime, uh, a, a lot of teachers are willing to, to come in for the meeting because they have a personal connection to the student and, and they're willing to come in, um, or they can be made available by phone, or you can waive their appearance. So if you feel that the meeting can be had without a few of the necessary participants that are required by law, you can waive their appearance, but you can absolutely have an IEP meeting uh, in the summertime. <clears throat> And if the transition plan is not working, request an IEP meeting and sit down and talk about it. Um, so, uh, okay, so before I move on, one of the things, and I didn't make up slides for this, but I, I, I did want to talk about this a little bit. I, you know, I said, I just want to make sure that both parents and service providers, that they understand what a parent and a student's rights are. If the IEP isn't working, if the transition plan is not working or it's not there, there are ways to address that. Um, you know, I mentioned earlier on a complaint investigation with OSE. I, I generally reserve complaint investigations for like uh, issues where the IEP is not being followed, where it's clear in writing what should be done. It's not worth going, <coughs> excuse me, it's not something you want to take in front of a judge because you want to get it enforced quickly, you do that. Um, uh, but there's other ways. When we talk about due process, that if you want to reject an IEP or you want to challenge an IEP, you want to request a service, it's denied, and you want to you want to fight for it, you can file for what is called due process. Due process is it's basically how you get in front of an administrative law judge to have a hearing on on the issue and have a judge make a decision. Um, if you go to uh, all you have to do is Google New Jersey Office of Special Education forms. And you will see there is a, a, a due process form. It's a fill in the blank form and they tell you how to file it and you can file it via email with the, uh, with the Office of Special Education. 
it, it is easy to do. The other thing that you can do is, is you can request mediation. Um, I could do a whole training on due process and mediation, but um, if you don't, if you don't want to go to due process, if you don't have the ability to hire a lawyer or are not able to obtain a pro bono attorney or anything like that, and you don't want something as onerous as as a hearing, a trial in front of a judge, you can try mediation. You can file for mediation only. If you file for mediation, the New Jersey Office of Special Ed has mediators. They will send them. Well, used to be they would send it. I think everything is still being done via Zoom. I don't know when things are going to go back in person. Um, Pre-pandemic, the mediator will come out to the district. You would go to the local board of ed meeting, and you would have a meet an independent, uh, you know, third party, a neutral mediator to try to help resolve the issues. Uh, right now, like I said, they they are doing they are doing them via Zoom. Um, it, it still works. I, I don't know. Um, there is something about being in person, being in the same room, um, that I think can sometimes help resolve things a little bit easily, the, easier than via Zoom. But um, but it is what it is for right now. So, so those are two options, mediation and due process. The other thing, and, and this is a little bit newer, the Office of Special Education, uh, the New Jersey Office of Special Education is offering what are called facilitated IEP meetings. A little bit different than mediation, but the idea is kind of the same. They're going to send somebody out to run the IEP meeting, to help facilitate it. So to resolve issues and conflicts before it would get to something like mediation or due process. And again, if you Google New Jersey Office of Special Ed forms, the form for a facilitated IEP meeting is there and, and it can be requested. It was it was only originally in uh, four counties. I, I'm fairly certain they've extended to all counties, but uh, you know, either way, it's still, it, if, if, you're, if you're not happy with the IEP and with the transition planning and what's been going on, it cannot hurt to do a facilitated IEP meeting. So again, if the transition plan isn't working, ask for an IEP meeting. If things still aren't going well, you can do a facilitated IEP meeting, you can file for mediation, and ultimately you can go to due process, uh, which I know it's much, I know it's easy for me to say go to due process. Um, you know, I've spoken to a lot of families over the years. I know, you know, it's, it's, it, is, it is a little bit of a scary situation. Um, one of the things to keep in mind, and, and you know, I, I've had parents ask me this on cases where I've only given, you know, advice. Uh, sometimes they'll file for due process and, you know, the district, uh, the, the board attorney for the district, um, you know, might send the parent a letter, you know, filing an answer. And they might also put in there that they're going to be seeking attorney's fees. One of the things I just want to mention, because sometimes that can really dissuade a parent from moving forward, because they think that if they lose, they might be on the hook for attorney's fees. So, in, in New Jersey, so, so typically in the American legal system, um, legal fees and court costs and things like that is uh, each party bears their own costs for litigating unless the statute that, a stat, that sets up the law that you're going in under, unless it has a fee shifting provision. Uh, the civil rights law, that's, that's, you know, that's, 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 the, that's the big one where you see a fee shifting provision. Uh, and, and the fee shifting provision usually only shifts in one way for an aggrieved party. So like in special education, if you're a parent and you hire an attorney and that attorney is successful at due process against the school district, they can go after the school district for attorney's fees. Now, I, I say it shifts one way. Is there ever a situation in which if a school is successful, they can go after a parent? The answer is, is yes, but it's very limited. They have to be able to show that the complaint, that the issue was frivolous and without merit. Merely losing at due process does not mean that it was a frivolous case. I, I, I mean, it, you know, the standard for that is, it's pretty high. You, I mean, you would really, as long as you can state, you know, as long as you can state a claim and a rationale or reason behind it, um, you know, for example, say like, you know, you file because you want a specific reading program for your child. You say, my child is in ninth grade and he's reading at a first grade level. Even if you wind up losing, you have brought a case that, in my professional opinion, uh, is, is a case that, that, that has merit. So, so to be able to get attorney's fees from a parent, it, it, it's few and far between. So if you ever do get that, you know, if you file for due process and you get the letter saying we plan to seek attorney's fees, you know, I, I know as an attorney, it's easy for me to say, don't freak out about it. Don't be worried about it still move forward. Um, you know, I know, I know when you get that letter, it can be, it can be scary. Um, but, but again, that fee shifting provision, it really, for the most part, only shifts the one way. It's very, again, it would have to be a frivolous without merit case before you'd have to be worried about being on the hook uh, for attorney's fees. 
Um, so that's kind of uh, what I wanted to talk about, uh, about special education and transitional services. So now I want to kind of talk about different things that you might want to look to as a student starts to transition out of school. Oh, wait, no, I'm sorry. Let me just blow past uh, these slides really quickly. Um, I want to talk about COVID-19. So I have about, I have about 10 minutes left. Uh, what I'll do, I'll stop at 12 o'clock and then I'll open it up for questions. So for anybody who wants to stay on longer, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll open it up for questions at 12. So really quickly, I want to touch on uh, COVID-19 extension of the age limit. As I had mentioned earlier, you get to go to, you can, you're eligible to go to school through June of your 21st birthday. Now, obviously, as I mentioned, I had, a, I had a client who, you know, all the, all the job coaching programs had shut down in that district. They had some really great programs. And then, you know, she obviously, she went over a year without really being able to do anything in that with those transitional services. School sent out, you know, academic stuff, but realistically, she was looking at the transitional stuff. So, so a new bill was passed. Uh, for students who were aging out from 20, in 2021 school, in, in June of 2021, June of 2022, or June of 2023, they could be eligible for an additional year of school. It's not an automatic guarantee. You have to show that there is a need. So the school has to convene an IEP meeting to determine that there is that need for the additional school. And if you're denied, you have to file for due process. Now, uh, back in April, uh, the New Jersey Department of Ed sent out a memo to clarify uh, a lot of stuff on, on, on this updated law. And basically, um, uh, so, so, so there's a two-year statute of limitations on filing for due process. The, the new statute uh, does extend uh, the period of time. So if, if, you, if you did not receive appropriate services from March 18, 2020 to September 1, 2021, you can file for due process at any time up to September 1st, 2023. School districts are required to hold an IEP meeting by December 31st, 2022 for every student with a disability to discuss the need for compensatory education. Comp Ed, in other words, if a student missed out on services during the height of the pandemic, you get Comp Ed, compensatory education. And that, that includes transitional services. So school districts are required to hold that meeting uh, by the end of this year. Um, there was the, there was another memo that was sent out uh, on the same date uh, back in April by uh, by the uh, New Jersey Department of Ed, and uh, just to clarify uh, on the IEP meetings, students who may have graduated, so students who went March 18, 2020 through September 1st, 2021, who may have graduated since then, the uh, the the district still has to identify them and hold an IEP meeting to see if they need comp ed services and they have to make reasonable efforts to contact those students and schedule a meeting. That's, that's important. Um, so I, I wanted to touch on that. So when we, so just not now talking about transition in, in general, when you're, you know, transition coming out of school, just some things to kind of uh, uh, be mindful of. Uh, again, I have about seven minutes. So these slides are available. You, you can certainly get them if you, if you want to look anything over. Um, You'll have my email address, I can send it, or contact the New Jersey uh, Youth Transition Conference host, and, uh, and they can send it to you as well. Um, so, so you want to look to healthcare needs as somebody's uh, aging out, you know, transitioning into adulthood. Uh, you want to see if the person's eligible for Medicaid. Um, you know, we have a couple of Medicaid-type programs here in New Jersey. Uh, the first, first for people with disabilities is the ABD program, the Age of Blind and Disabled program for Medicaid. Um, there are income and asset uh, limits. So, you know, as, as, a, as a student is aging out and transitioning into adulthood, you want to make sure their health care needs are met. You want to see if they're entitled to uh, Medicaid. And if you just go to the New Jersey Family Care website, there's uh, all the application stuff is on there to apply. Um, so that's something. Uh, and, and, and if somebody is out and about and working, uh, but they, ha they have a disability, they could still be eligible for uh, Medicaid under the New Jersey Workability Medicaid. Again, if you Google it, you can you know, find the applications and there are income uh, guidelines for that. Um, housing, housing is obviously a big issue as somebody is transitioning into adulthood, uh, whether they're gonna continue to live with family. Um, if not, you do wanna look uh, for affordable housing. Uh, affordable housing is, um, well, th there are difficulties in obtaining affordable housing. There's, there's not a lot of affordable housing out there these days. Um, if you have somebody whose income is limited, they do have a disability and they are again transitioning into adulthood. Um, you know, if they're not already uh, living in subsidized housing with a family that they can continue to live in, you want to see about getting their, you know, you want to apply for the, the different types of subsidized housings, start getting on the wait lists because some of these uh, subsidized housings have, you know, years long wait lists, some of them. 
you know, you have the public housing authorities, then you have the various subsidized housing like Section 8 vouchers. Obviously, if somebody is at imminent risk of homelessness, there are emergency uh, services out there. Uh, you know, county welfare, the county social services do have EA, emergency assistance programs, but there are income uh, restrictions for, for a lot of these uh, programs. But it's something to think about as, as the student is uh, transitioning into adulthood. Um, financial, that is a big one as well. If you have a student who is aging out and they are not able to work, uh, entering the workforce is not an option. You want to make sure that they have a, a, an income stream. Um, SSI, uh, Supplemental Security Income, that's available to people who are unable to work due to a disability. Um, do I have SSD? No, I don't. Uh, SSD, Social Security Disability, that's where somebody has worked in a certain amount of quarters in their lifetime and they're eligible to Social Security Disability. But if you have somebody age, you know, aging out of school and transitioning into adulthood and they are not able to work, you should see if they're eligible for, for SSI. Um, and uh, well, there's a link in here. Um, uh, to the SSA website uh, for the application uh, process. Okay, so one of the other things too, especially as somebody is aging out, you want to, you know, is is this somebody that's going to need help making decisions moving forward? What is their capacity to make decisions? And there's there's various types of decision making. There are there's the non judicial, the you know ser, you know alternate surrogate kind of decision making, where you have supported decision making, you have rep payees, power of attorneys, and then healthcare uh, uh, representatives. And then there's the judicial guardianship. That's when somebody lacks capacity to make any and all decisions. Then you're going to look towards guardianship. Um, supported decision making is the least restrictive option. It's one that we generally try to encourage families to participate in. Um, there's no real legal kind of basis for supported decision making. There's no paperwork. It's basically where you have a young adult and you surround that young adult with a team, a team of family members, friends, and professionals that can help support them in making uh, decisions. And that is the least restrictive option. And we encourage families to, to, to try to take advantage of that and put together a team to help that youth as they transition into adulthood. Um, for youth that are uh, transitioning into adulthood and they do have SSI or SSD benefits and they're not able to necessarily manage their funds, one way to assist is just having a, a, a representative payee. Uh, that is somebody that would have the payment sent to them, and then they would handle and manage the money. It could be a family member. It could be a qualified organization if there are no family members or friends that can assist with that. Power of attorney is one that we talk, uh, I talk to folks a lot about. The person has to have the, they do have to have competency. They do have to understand what a power of attorney is to appoint a power of attorney. With a power of attorney, the individual retains all their rights. They can reject the power, revoke the power of attorney at any point in time. They can make their own decisions. Nobody is taking away their ability to make decisions. I love, I, I, you know, I, in trying to work with families, um, I, I always look to his power of attorney a way that we can go because, again, it does not take away any rights of the of the individual, and it allows a family member uh, or friend, depending on who they want to appoint, the ability to help them with decisions. You know. Uh, whether it's, you know, uh, setting up a bank account, accessing a bank account, being able to go to court for them, hire people to do things for them, you know, that's what a power of attorney, and it's durable. If you do it right, you do a durable power of attorney, it'll survive in capacity. So if something bad happens on down the line, um, you know, the, the power of attorney will still be uh, in effect. Um, so for a power of attorney to be valid, it does have to be in writing. And again, the person retains all of their decision-making abilities and they can revoke at any point in time. My advice, if you're gonna revoke it, it well, not, not if, you have to, it has to be in writing. It has to be, the revocation has to be in writing, notarized, and you have to send it to the attorney, in fact, via certified mail. But this one is important. Not everybody always thinks to do this. The power of attorney could be on file somewhere. It could be on file at your local bank. Anywhere you think that power of attorney is on file, send your revocation notice. Um, that's just something something important that has popped up from time to time. So, uh, oh, uh, and for healthcare purposes, if the person needs help making healthcare decisions, obviously you, I shouldn't say obviously, outside of guardianship, you can't take away a person's ability to, to make their own healthcare decisions unless they become incapacitated. And that's where you can either do an advanced directive or a healthcare proxy. With an advanced directive, it's where the person knows there are situations that I know are going to come up and these are the direct instructions I have. You know, the best example is, is I don't want, you know, if I'm, you know, brain dead, I don't want artificial nutrients keeping me alive. You put that in an advanced directive, also known as a living will. Then there's the healthcare proxy. You may not necessarily know what you want to do if you become incapacitated, but you know, you want a parent, a sibling, a friend, you want that person to make those decisions 
once a doctor says you're no longer able to. Um, I think my time is up. So just uh, really quickly, if you want guardianship, again, only if the person is truly incapacitated, cannot make any decisions, that's when you kind of look at guardianship, but really you want to look for those least restrictive options. Uh, and again, you can request the slides. I'm just going to go all the way to the end really quickly. Whoop. Oh, shoot. Sorry. Um, okay. That uh, my email address and phone number are there. So I'm going to hit uh, stop sharing. I'll throw it in the chat as well. Uh, I can do that for I... you, Sean, if you want. Okay. How do I stop sharing? Um, there should be a stop share button on your Zoom um, toolbar. Oh, there it is. Okay. And right. we do have a few questions that came into the chat. I don't know if you want me to read them to you or um, I did copy yes. and paste them into it. Okay. The first one is if a school has not done a functional vocational assessment for a 17 year old, can or should the parents request that? If they haven't done it, I would say yes. I, I mean, again, going back to what I was saying in the slide presentation, it, it depends on what the what the transition plan is and the post-secondary -sec, uh, goals. If if the student is looking at higher education, <clears throat> an FVA might not be something they need. But if you are looking more vocational, more at trying to enter the workforce, then absolutely an FVA. Make the request in writing for the district to do it. If if the district says no, um, you know, request it as an independent evaluation. I, you know, as I said before, I I, I really think that it's if it's done right, it's a great uh, it's a great evaluation. Great. The other question relates to that topic as well. Who conducts a fun functional vocational assessment, a teacher, a school psychologist, or someone else? So I've had, as I think I mentioned, the one experience I had, I did have a school psychologist that did conduct it. Um, when I've requested them, though, I, I, I've requested specific, uh, a specific agency to do it. Um, generally, what it's been... Um, the, I remember there was one agency, again, I can't remember the name, it was down in South Jersey, and I really, really, really liked them. And I remember the, the person that ran point on, um, the person that ran point on uh, uh, on preparing the actual final written thing, I believe was a LDTC, a learning disability teacher consultant. So it doesn't necessarily need to, you're not, it could be a school site, it could be somebody with a psychological, you know, school psychologist background, could be something with an, somebody with an LDTC background. Um, it, it's more you just want to make sure that it is somebody that that does have that experience in, in, in doing functional vocational assessments, um, whether whether the age, whether it's a, an evaluator out in the community um, that specifically does them or does or you know does them. Sometimes you just want to make sure that they have that experience doing them. Someone said, "Is it the occupational training center you're thinking of, Sean? Maybe." No, no. it started with an A. Okay, that's fine. Um, and one other question that came in um, is it, um, asking you if you have any examples of well done transition plans from IEPs, or if you could recommend a place where folks could look to see that sort of a thing. So everything I have, unfortunately, well, I'd say unfortunately, it's uh, it, unfortunately it would be privileged uh, and confidential. I I wouldn't feel comfortable trying to um, trying to redact uh, to share with people. Um, sure. In terms of where you I, can I can just, them. I'll oh. just chime in and say I, well, I'm with Stan Parent Advocacy Network, and we have a lot of resources about transition planning um, on our website, and I also did post a link to our YouTube channel, um, a number of workshops there. Um, we do workshops on you know, the, the concept of transition planning and also some other like student-led IEPs. So we might have some resources that would be helpful um, if folks want to check that out as well. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Jean. Yeah, definitely check out what uh, SPAN has on their website. I mean, like, I'll, I'll give you an example. I had a student, um, you know, kind of, the, the entering the workforce was one aspect of the transitional plan, but life skills was the other, you know, um, the student wasn't, uh, I remember the parents saying, this, you know, if, if, if the student had a job, the student wouldn't be able to, you know, get on a bus and and, and go to the job. So, like in the transition plan, uh, so like in the transition plan, one thing there was a whole thing about uh, a section for life skills, and then there were actual goals and objectives. Goal was uh, identified as you know, student to be able to. Um, I forget the exact wording, but it was basically be, being able to understand, you know, how to use the New Jersey Transit, uh, and then like uh, objectives and things like that. It was you know, uh, use the NJ Transit app successfully, uh, you know, uh, ride the bus to certain points and destinations, uh, you know, on four consecutive occasions, and they built it into the life skills training. 
So, I mean, that's kind of when you're looking at the transition plan, it, 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 it's very, it's going to, it should be individualized. It just, the main thing I can say is, is, and I've seen it before, it just shouldn't be check, check marks on boxes. It, it, it should be individualized and it should state specifically what, what's going to be provided. Great. There's one other question came in. Is FAPE applicable to 18 to 21 uh, year old transition programs at high schools? And yeah. there's a second part to that. I'll let you answer that first. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, when you're a special education student, whether you know whether you're in a pre-K uh, disability program at age three, or you're 20 years old and you're in a transitional program, uh, there is the burden is on the district to provide FAPE to make sure that that program is providing you with an appropriate education. Um, and if it's not, I mean, again, request the IEP meeting, talk to the district, see if you can work it out. And if you can't, that's what. You know, that's what due I know it's easy for me to say that's what due process is for. I know for parents it can be sometimes a little bit um, you know, daunting, but that, that's that's what it's there for, you know, between the mediators, uh uh getting in front of the judge for the settlement conference, you know, there are ways to try to resolve it so it doesn't ultimately always have to wind up ending in a trial. Um, so but yeah. And the second part of the question is um they're asking if 18 to 20 year old students are allowed to take elective classes offered at the high school and to participate in high school extracurricular programs that is a good question i, I, don't, I, I think the answer I is yes <laughs> yeah i think I, I think in terms of extracurricular i don't know how it works with with sports and like the different rules that um uh the different rules that like the um Oh God, I forgot the names of them. But like uh, for 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 the competitive sports teams, I know that there are certain rules that they have. Right. So I'm not a hundred percent certain how that works, but I don't see any reason, you know, for extracurricular activities why somebody in the 18 to 20 range wouldn't be allowed to. Um, but I, it's not something I I dealt with, so I don't yeah I I don't have a clear answer. And the electives I would think would be a, an option depending on the individual needs of that student. The, the IEP team would meet and figure out what the schedule should look like to meet their needs. So, okay. I don't see any other questions unless I missed anything. Um, I really, we really appreciate your presentation today and taking these questions. And um, I think I'm gonna go ahead and wrap us up. Um, so uh, that concludes our workshop, Special Education Transition Services. And we really appreciate um, the Community Health Law Project and Sean for sharing your knowledge and resources. The workshop recording will be made available on our website in November. If you are in need of proof of attendance for continuing ed credits, you'll receive an email soon with your certificate. It is up to your employer to accept this as proof. You will not receive your certificate if you did not register using the form shared today. And you can reach us at our New Jersey Youth Transition at gmail.com. I'll put that in the chat too. And everybody have a great afternoon and join us again later today for some other exciting sessions. Thanks again, Sean. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me. Have a good rest of the day, everybody.